man phoning to inquire about hotel information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. You're through to reception at the Island Hotel in Crete. How may I help you today? Yes, hello there. I'm hoping to book a double room for my wife and myself for about two weeks from the 25th of April of this year. Firstly, could you tell me whether it's particularly hot during this time? Yes, of course, sir. During late April and early May, the daytime temperature shouldn't exceed 19 degrees Celsius. But the weather has been rather erratic and difficult to predict in recent years, so I am unable to say for certain. OK, that sounds good. My wife doesn't like going outside when it's very hot. I haven't booked flights yet but I must say that I'm unfamiliar with Crete and its transport system. Does the hotel provide an airport shuttle service? Yes, sir. We provide a complimentary airport pickup service for all our guests. It takes about 40 minutes to get here from the airport, but it's at least 60 minutes at rush hours, and you will be provided with a fully air-conditioned shuttle bus. OK, excellent. In that case, do you have any rooms available for the dates I gave you? I shall have a look on the system now for you, sir. Bear with me just a moment. Yes, sir. I can see now that we have several rooms available. Would you prefer a garden view or a sea view? Well, ideally, I would like a sea view room with a balcony. But of course, that depends on the difference in price. Not to worry, sir. All of our standard double rooms have ensuite facilities and a balcony. If you would like one of our sea view rooms, there is a premium of 60 euros per night. OK. So, could you tell me the total nightly rate for a standard double room with a sea view? Yes, of course, sir. For the spring months, our rate is 216 euros per night. For 14 nights altogether, this will come to 3,024 euros. Perfect. I also read on your website that the hotel has gym and spa facilities. Are there any other facilities on offer? Yes, we have a large outdoor infinity pool overlooking the ocean with luxury sunbeds and a poolside bar. We also have three full-size tennis courts where we run a popular doubles tournament with the winner receiving two all-inclusive spa day vouchers. Goodness, I shall have to brush up on my tennis skills. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Are there any other activities organised by the hotel that we can partake in? It's just that it's our wedding anniversary on the 30th of June, and I would like to provide my wife with a perfect romantic getaway. I can assure you, sir, that your wife won't be disappointed. Ours is a five-star resort, which is renowned for its luxury and beauty. In terms of activities, the hotel provides thrice-weekly entertainment. On Tuesdays, Guests will take a minibus and partake in learning to cook succulent fish dishes with our Michelin-starred chef, Enrique. The class will take place in a beautiful valley deep in the Cretan Hills, where guests will be treated to an intimate piano performance by our in-house concert pianist, Pedro. On Wednesdays, a select number of guests will be fortunate enough to explore the mountains by helicopter. 
before being transported to a tropical Cretan garden by shuttle bus. Finally, on Thursdays, after a fancy dinner, we provide a spectacular fireworks display, which guests can view from the comfort of a cable car. Oh wow! That all sounds absolutely wonderful. I shall book the room now, and then I need to look at flights so as not to become extortionate. Would you like to take my details now or later? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions eleven to twenty. You now have some time to read questions eleven to twenty first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see. It's a computerised catalogue system, and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university, so make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area, the place for returned books and other items, is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on closed reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level two only. On level two are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the audio visual resource centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the audio visual resource centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use, and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room, or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone 
and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now, and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a professor and a student talking about taking a course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, Dr. Twain. May I speak with you for a minute? Of course, please come in. I'm Charlotte York. I'm considering taking your course in tourism. Right. Well, Charlotte, how can I help you? I have been considering studying tourism. However, it is such an important decision that I would like to seek some advice about it first. Would you mind answering some of my questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Well, I have been discussing courses with my parents and they are concerned that I will not be able to get a well-paid job with a degree in tourism. The reason that I want to study the course is that I have a great interest in the subject and I think I would really enjoy it. I believe the only way that I will enjoy my life is if I enjoy my career. Happiness is far more important than money, don't you think? Absolutely. I would much rather be happy and poor rather than rich and miserable. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'm glad you agree. You needn't worry about money, Charlotte. A large part of the tourism course is dedicated to teaching students how to manage finances a skill that you can apply to your everyday life as well. I would also recommend that you take a sideline course in time management, as this can be incredibly useful in efficiently planning your workload. Efficiency is the key to success. I'll remember that. Now, I have found that some students have natural talents that really help them to succeed in the course. Communication skills, for example, can be very beneficial. Do you have any strengths? Maths was always my favourite subject at school, so I really enjoy solving mathematical problems. However, I find statistics quite difficult. I have always been very capable and self-sufficient. I have a lot of confidence in my abilities and will take the initiative in situations without needing to depend on anyone else for their help. That's a really great quality to have and will be particularly useful if you choose to study tourism. That's great. I would recommend that you spend some of your time researching the course. A lot of people who are uneducated on the subject claim that tourism is a shrinking industry and that it will become irrelevant in the future. If you study the published research, however, you will see that the truth is quite the opposite. The industry has, in fact, grown significantly as people have developed an ever-increasing interest in culture and travel. Have you compared the university course with a polytechnic? Yes, I have. 
I was interested in studying the course in modules. However, the university doesn't offer that option. I don't have enough funds to be able to attend an expensive university, so I was relieved to see that the course is quite affordable. I also considered attending a summer school instead of university to save money, and so that I could work during the rest of the year. But I really wanted the university experience. I think that university would suit you well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, what about the courses? Are you interested in any of the other subjects on offer? I have looked at a few. I was interested in travel and business as it sounds similar to tourism. That is really worth learning. However, be aware that it is difficult and will demand a lot of your time. OK, that's good to know. You might find that Japanese is an interesting course and it will teach you valuable skills in speaking the language. Personally, it's not bad and could be of some help, but not that much. OK, Japanese. Got that. What about medical care? Well, if you have time, the course will teach you a lot about curing diseases and illnesses or dealing with injuries outside, although it's not essential. So, OK, if it's useful, I'll take it. If you enjoy using technology and are worried about fulfilling the entry requirements, computing is very relaxed about the skills that applicants must possess. I'm terrible with computers, so I'm not sure that I would enjoy that course. How about public relations? Yes, I would recommend that course. It would be related to entering the tourism industry as it will educate you on how to approach clients and develop associations with them. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Complete the notes made by one of the students present. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. 
It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers. And not a conscious effort to attack someone, but that is perhaps a case of、um, of my being naive or over hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points.、Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes, right. Off we go. Now answer questions thirty-four to forty. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes made by one of the students present. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management; it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique, especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands. Which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice, with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes. Okay. You have got twenty minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.